You're listening to The Philosopher's Note on the psychology of winning. More wisdom in less time. Hi, this is Brian. Welcome to The Philosopher's Notes on The Psychology of Winning, 10 Qualities of a Total Winner by Dr. Dennis Whaley. Start with a quote. The term winning may sound phony to you, too materialistic, too full of A's or luck or odds or muscle-bound athletes. True winning, however, is no more than one's own personal pursuit of individual excellence. You don't have to knock other people down or gain at the expense of others. Winning is taking the talent and potential you were born with and have since developed and using it fully toward a goal or purpose that makes you happy. End quote. That's Dr. Dennis Waitley from The Psychology of Winning. Winning. No need to get all up in your stuff if the word doesn't appeal to you. Let's think of it as our, quote, personal pursuit of individual excellence. That approach reminds me of the fact that in ancient Greece, guys like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle said that if we want to experience consistent happiness, we need to live with what they called arete, a word that literally translates as excellence or virtue, but has a deeper meaning, something closer to striving to live at your highest potential. I love that. Winning as arete in action. So back to the psychology of winning. Dennis Waitley is an old-school 20th century self-development rock star who's still rocking it in the 21st century, and this book is a quick reading collection of big ideas. Let's explore some of my favorites, shall we? We'll start with the first big idea. How are you taking it? Quote, The most important single point in the chapters to follow to remember and internalize is that it makes little difference what is actually happening. It's how you, personally, take it that really counts. End quote. So this is the 85th note I've created, and I'm starting to find it almost amusing how often the same exact thing is repeated again and again and again. How about this from uh, my last note, note number 84 on flow, the psychology of optimal experience. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi says this, quote, A person can make himself happy or miserable regardless of what is actually happening outside, just by changing the contents of consciousness. We all know individuals who can transform hopeless situations into challenges to be overcome, just through the force of their own personalities. This ability to persevere despite obstacles and setbacks is the quality people most admire in others, and justly so, it is probably the most important trait, not only for succeeding in life, but for enjoying it as well. To develop this trait, one must find ways to order consciousness so as to be in control of feelings and thoughts. It is best not to expect shortcuts will do the trick. End quote. Me likes. And I trust you've read some of the other notes or listened to some of the other notes. So I'm going to refrain from going off as a quoting machine here. But please, all caps, understand that this is always, all caps, described as the most important attribute to living a great life. From the Buddha and Marcus Aurelius to Jack Canfield and Stephen Covey. So let's make sure we get the big idea. And for now, we will move on to some more big ideas on how to get our winning on. I like this next one. An inventory bag. Capital B, capital A, capital G, bag. Quote, take inventory of your good reasons for self-esteem today. Write down what your bag is. Capital B, A, G, bag. Blessings. Who and what are you thankful for? Accomplishments. What you have done that you're proud of so far and goals, what your dreams and ambitions are, end quote. That's a really cool exercise and similar to something I've been doing for a while now. Every day for about 100 days or so, I wrote down five things I'm proud of, five things I will be proud of, five things I'm grateful for, five things I'm excited about, and five truths I live by. Like I said, I did that for 100 plus days and I mixed it up every day and really dug it. Super cool. So the question for you here is, are you journaling? Please say yes. It's one of the most powerful ways we can deepen our clarity and increase our happiness. In fact, in our note on happy for no reason, we discussed the fact that keeping a gratitude journal has been scientifically proven to raise our happiness set points. That's a very good thing. 
As Marcy Shymoff points out in her book, quote, In an experiment by Dr. Robert Emmons at the University of California, Davis, people who kept a gratitude journal, a weekly record of things they felt grateful for, enjoyed better physical health, were more optimistic, exercised more regularly, and described themselves as happier than a control group who didn't keep journals, end quote. That's a pretty good reason to keep a journal, if you didn't notice. <laughs> The second question, what's in your bag, B-A-G, blessings, accomplishments, goals? And uh, I suggest that now is a pretty good time to take our first pass at that bag. So if you can, why don't you stop and write with me? If not, maybe you can press pause and uh, reflect on it. In the PDF, we have space to actually write this down. So let's think about it. These are some of my many blessings, the B in bag, the people and things I'm thankful for. Press pause and think about that for a moment. Who are you most thankful for in your life? Who are you blessed to have in your life? And what things are you blessed to have in your life? And next, accomplishments. Let's think of some things that you've done that you're proud of accomplishing so far in your life. What are some accomplishments? The A in bag. And finally, what are your goals, your dreams and ambitions that inspire you daily? B-A-G, blessings, accomplishments, goals. Super cool exercise. And I suggest we go shopping and fill up our bag at least weekly, if not every day. So there you go, an inventory bag. The next big idea is stay on target and score a hit. Quote, every winner I have ever met knows where he or she is going day by day, every day. Winners are goal-oriented. They set and get what they want consistently. They are self-directed on the road to fulfillment. Fulfillment or success has been defined as the progressive realization of goals that are worthy of the individual. The human system is goal-seeking by design and, using a very basic analogy, may be compared to a homing torpedo system or an automatic pilot. Set your target in this self-activated system, constantly monitoring feedback signals from the target area and adjusting course setting in its own navigational guidance computer makes every correction necessary to stay on target and score a hit. Programmed incompletely, non-specifically, or aimed at a target too far out of range, the homing torpedo will wander erratically around until its propulsion system fails or self-destructs. And so it is with each individual human system in life. End quote. Good stuff. Totally reminds me of Maxwell Maltz's great book, Psycho-Cybernetics. You can see the notes on that. All about this big idea that we're goal-seeking beings who need a clear target to function well. And lest you think this is just some kind of pop psychology, know that this is pretty much exactly what Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, arguably the world's leading scientist on optimal living, says in Flow. You can see those notes too. First, we'll start with Maltz. He says, quote, Creative striving for a goal that is important to you as a result of your own deep felt needs, aspirations, and talents, and not the symbols which the Joneses expect you to display, brings happiness as well as success, because you will be functioning as you were meant to function. Man is by nature a goal-striving being, and because man is built that way, he is not happy unless he is functioning the way he was made to function, as a goal-striver. Thus, true success and true happiness not only go together, but each enhances the other. End quote. And now Cheek sent me high. He says, quote, The optimal state of inner experience is one in which there is order in consciousness. This happens when psychic energy or attention is invested in realistic goals and when skills match the opportunities for action. The pursuit of a goal brings order in awareness because a person must concentrate attention on the task at hand and momentarily forget everything else. These periods of struggling to overcome challenges are what people find to be the most enjoyable of their lives. A person who has achieved control over psychic energy and has invested it in consciously chosen goals cannot help but grow into a more complex being. By stretching skills, by reaching toward higher challenges, such a person becomes an increasingly extraordinary individual. End quote. Now, you, how are your goals? Are you channeling your life energy toward realistic goals that give you meaning? Or are you kind of spinning around like a missile without a clear target, ready to self destruct in a not so pretty fashion? 
Good news is that simply clarifying what's important to you and creating goals in line with those values and, of course, pursuing them will get you in flow faster than you can say, what up? So I say, let's rock that. And while we're on the subject, this is good to keep in mind as well. Quote, one of the best ways to develop adaptability to the stresses of life is to view them as normal. Earl Nightingale tells of a visit he made with his son recently to the Great Barrier Reef, which stretches nearly 1,800 miles from New Guinea to Australia. Noticing that the coral polyps on the inside of the reef, where the sea was tranquil and quiet in the lagoon, appeared pale and lifeless, while the coral on the outside of the reef, subject to the surge of the tide and power of the waves, were bright and vibrant with splendid colors and flowing growth, Earl Nightingale asked why this was so. It's very simple, came the reply. The coral on the lagoon side dies rapidly with no challenge for growth and survival, while the coral facing the surge and power of the open sea thrives and multiplies because it is challenged and tested every day. And so it is with every living organism on earth. Love that. Brings us to the next big idea. How's your motive? Quote, motivation is a much maligned, over-franchised, over-promoted, and misunderstood term. The word motive is defined as that within the individual rather than outside, which incites him or her to action, an idea, need, emotion, or organic state that prompts us to action. I like looking at the word motive in motivation. In short, what's your reason for acting? Pay attention to whether you're driven to impress others or if you're truly inspired to rock something, and then lean toward the latter. As Whaley says, quote, motivation is a force which moves us to action, and it springs from inside the individual, end quote. The next big idea is a great one, butterflies and moths. Quote, when you get butterflies in your stomach before a performance, accept them as butterflies. Butterflies are nice. When they start to eat you, they are like moths. Moths in your stomach are not nice. They cause ulcers, end quote. That's funny. Butterflies are cool. Moths? Not so much. Whaley talks about this in the context of healthy desires and says this, quote, Positive tension produced by desire is like a bow pulled taut to propel the arrow to the bullseye. In a totally tension-free state, you are either comatose or dead. Viktor Frankl, noted psychiatrist and founder of the psychotherapeutic school known as Logotherapy, flatly states that what a person actually needs is not a tensionless state, but the striving and struggling for a goal that is worthy of him or her. End quote. Amen. Oftentimes, especially when exploring Eastern mysticism, we mistakenly try to get rid of all of our desires and the tension we believe they create. Alas, it's not the desires that create the negative tension. It's the fear and doubt and worry and attachment that creates the negative tension. The challenge is to hold the bow taut with the tension of our desires and then joyfully celebrate each step of the process as we move toward our goal with flexibility, patience, and enthusiasm. And reorienting our relationship to fear is always a good thing. Those butterflies, let's learn to smile at them rather than allow them to evolve into moths that eat us up. And check out the notes on overachievement for a fun look at how the most powerful among us learn to eat stress like a power bar. As John Elliott advises in his great book, Overachievement, he says this, quote, Working on techniques to manage stress is a bit like trying to win the Indy 500 by putting a governor on the engine of your race car, or swapping out a powerful V12 for a V4 because it offers a quieter ride. You wouldn't do that. Not if you were after the checkered flag. Not if you were racing star Jeff Gordon. No superstar is about to give his opponents an edge. Nor should you by trying to relax when the pressure's on. Next big idea, personal optimism and enthusiasm. Quote, the most readily identifiable quality of a total winner is an attitude of personal optimism and enthusiasm, end quote. Well, there you go. The most readily identifiable quality of a total winner is an attitude of personal optimism and enthusiasm. How's your optimism and enthusiasm? 
We go off on the importance of optimism in our notes on learned optimism by the godfather of positive psychology, Martin Seligman. After years of studying learned helplessness, which, by the way, one of the strongest predictors of depression is our level of disempowerment or helplessness. So after studying helplessness, Seligman articulates how we can learn to be more optimistic and, of course, why we should care. Check out the note for details on both. For now, know it's big and you can do a lot about it. And enthusiasm. In case you haven't heard or read my other 50 references to it, remember that enthusiasm comes from the Greek entheos and literally means God within. That's awesome. When we're on, we're total winners, as Waitley would say, we've got God in the house, and the world knows it via the enthusiasm that radiates from within us. The next big idea is concentrate all your energy. Quote, concentrate all your energy and intensity without distraction on the successful completion of your current project. Finish what you start, end quote. This is one of my absolute favorite self-management and time management big ideas. Brian Tracy describes it this way. You can see the notes on focal point. Quote, once you have thought through your work and decided on your most valuable task, you must discipline yourself to start it immediately and stay with it until it is complete. When you concentrate single-mindedly on a single task without diversion or distraction, you get it done far faster than if you start and stop and then come back to the task and pick it up again. You can reduce the amount of time you spend on a major task by as much as 80% simply by refusing to do anything else until that task is complete, end quote. Powerful stuff. On a higher level, this reminds me of a conversation I had with my mentor for my first business, E-Teams. Quick context. I raised $5 million as a 24, 25-year-old CEO of an internet business during the late 90s. We were on a roll and hired the CEO of Adidas to replace me as our CEO so we could go out and raise another $20 million and then go public. Then the market crashed and we had 45 employees and a huge burn and dwindling cash. I vividly remember Steve Wynn, our new CEO and super cool dude, telling me, it's not how you start something, it's how you finish it that matters. That became my guiding principle as we navigated some tough times and eventually sold the business to one of our two competitors who had raised 10 times more capital. So let's remember, concentrate all your energy and intensity without distraction on the successful completion of your current project. Finish what you start. That brings us to our next big idea, planning our ideal lives. Quote, most people spend more time planning a party, studying the newspaper, or making a Christmas list than they do in planning their lives, end quote. So simple and so true. I don't know about you, but I'm all about making my life one rockin' party. You? And isn't it funny how much time we spend planning a vacation or a party or a wedding and how little we usually spend planning our ideal lives, from our ideal job to our ideal day-to-day lifestyle to our ideal relationships? So let's address that now. Take a moment to appreciate how wonderful your life is today and how much you've grown over the last decade and all the things that are going right. When you're feeling that and smiling at all the goodness already in your life, let's explore your ideal. You have a magic wand. Wave it. Now imagine your ideal day. What are you doing? What time do you get up? What do you do for fun and for work? And please tell me there's a lot of overlap there. With whom do you spend your time? Where are you? How do you feel? Map it out. Take the time, right now would be very good, to start getting more and more clarity on what you'd like to see in your life. I've done this type of exercise dozens, probably hundreds of times over the last decade, and now I'm blessed to pretty much be living the current version of my ideal. I'm on an island in the South Pacific, Go Bali, where I'm getting paid to read and write as I create philosopher's notes. I teach a class on philosophy twice a week at the local yoga studio, Rise with the Sun every day. It shows up over the rice fields and jungle and shines straight into my bedroom, which has open architecture so the breeze and fireflies can cruise in at night. Then I meditate for an hour, do some